Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back from spring break. Hope everybody had a nice week. I would like to welcome you to the March edition of our public health speaker series here at the Brown School. Thanks to those of you who are here in person and thanks to those of you who are joining us online. Uh, before I introduce our speaker today, just as a reminder, we'll have about uh, 40 to 45 minutes of our presenter talking, then we'll have um, time for question and answers at the end. Uh, for those of you online, feel free to put your questions in the chat, and we will try to our best to do a mix of in-person and questions from the Zoom chat when we get to that point. Um, so I have the great honor, my name is Angela Hobson, and I am the Associate Dean for Public Health here at the Brown School, and I have the great honor of introducing our speaker for today, Dr. Trinidad Jackson, who's here to talk about the ultimate entanglement, your life, the public health, the public's health, and sweet addictions to violence. Dr. Trinidad Jackson hails from St. Louis, Missouri, Hello. so from St. Louis, here we go. Right. Um, and current resides in Louisville, Kentucky. A proud HBCU undergraduate alum, Dr. Jackson attended Kentucky State University, focusing on psychology and biology. He went on to obtain a master's degree in clinical psychology at Moorhead State and public health at the University of Louisville. As a mental health professional, he provided therapy to community members from the most marginalized neighborhoods in Louisville. He put his public health training to use in Nashville, Tennessee, as he managed CDC-funded chronic disease prevention policy projects with community members and organizations, created health equity initiatives with Metro Nashville Public Health Department executive leadership, and co-led fatherhood initiatives supported by the Administration for Children and Families. Dr. Jackson has also led participatory teaching, research, and policy change initiatives across multiple communities in Ghana, West Africa. In November 2014, the fight for collective liberation summoned Dr. Jackson's mind, body, and spirit back to St. Louis as a disruptor and social movement scientist during the Ferguson Uprising. And then upon returning to Louisville in 2015, he led community-based participatory research that explored power, oppression, and the need for critical consciousness and action through lenses of justice, equity, safety, hope, and racial equity. That uprising of the century has informed his actions for liberation across all levels of our landscape, including policy. His work has been disseminated at local, national, and international levels through academic publications, presentations, and art mediums. He is currently the Assistant Dean for Culture and Liberation and Assistant Professor in Health Promotion and Behavioral Sciences at the University of Louisville. And he holds, joint, uh, holds a joint appointment as a senior advisor within Kentucky State's government, which I'm pretty sure we're gonna hear a little bit about today. Um, and I'm so glad and, and honored that St. Louis summoned you back here for a little bit of time today. And I believe you got some family members in the audience too. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, with that, please help me give a warm welcome to Dr. Trinidad Jackson. What's up, good people? Y'all real silent. Uh, hey, Jackie, what's up? <laughs> Y'all real silent. I'm a loud person sometimes, so I might summon you all to engage in a little noise making with me. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hobson, for you know engaging me in this space. We met last year at a conference for Associations for Schools and Programs for Public Health that was held here in St. Louis. And her and a couple of her team members were like, yo, we got to get you back home. And so here I am. So thank you for bringing me. Shout out to my mama. Shout out to <laughs> and my other family members, my auntie. I'm at the Grammys, y'all. You know what I'm saying? I'm <laughs> my auntie, my brother, my sister, and there anybody else who I might not see is glares from the glasses. But and I'm from U City, I gotta say that. Uh, from U City. So the ultimate entanglement, your life, the public's health, and sweet addictions to violence. So what I wanna know uh, from a couple of y'all, y'all can shout it out. What are some of the first thoughts when you hear the word entanglement? Jada. Hmm. 
ain't even got to waste no time. You won the prize. <laughs> right? She became a poster child a few years ago, right? When we think about the word entanglement after she revealed her personal entanglement uh, and the person with whom she was entangled, right? And so some of us know that to be Mr. August Alcina, right? And so just from the media engagement and some of the, you know, images that we saw of them, some of the interviews was relational at times, you know, seemed like they might've had a lot of fun, uh, but that's not the type of entanglement we're here to talk about today, but shout out to Jada for lifting that up into our consciousness. So in the title you, you saw and you heard the word violence, and so as we think about our field, our discipline, public health, uh, there are some overarching governing and supporting bodies like the CDC and the World Health Organization that we look to for things like technical assistance, collaboration, funding, additional types of support. And so these organizations, these entities also influence and they set the frame for how work gets done, how work gets achieved within our discipline when we talk about particular constructs of interest, um, but also that somewhat of a reciprocal relationship. Us as professionals, us as community members, et cetera, we can influence these entities as well. Uh, and so when we look here, we have the World Health Organization's definition of violence. Um, and so as I read this, I want you to think about, you know, to the extent that you agree with it, is it generally acceptable to you? The intentional use of physical force or power, threatened or actual, against oneself, another person, or against a group or community that either results in or has a high likelihood of resulting in injury, death, psychological harm, maldevelopment, or deprivation. Agreeable to that? See here, it shakes. All right, cool. So now uh, I'm about to play a brief video. I think it's about two and a half, three minutes long. And as you all engage this video, I want you uh, to just note your insights, note your reflections about what you hear. Norwegian theorist Johan Galtung developed a three-layered understanding of violence that represents how a confluence of factors merge in particular historical moments to shape the conditions for the promotion of violence. Direct violence is what we normally think of when we think about violence. It represents behaviors that serve to threaten life itself and or to diminish one's capacity to meet basic human needs, such as killing, maiming, bullying, sexual assault, and emotional manipulation. Structural violence represents the systematic ways in which some groups are hindered from equal access to opportunities, to goods, and services that enable the fulfillment of basic human needs. These can be formal, as in legal structures that enforce marginalization, such as apartheid in South Africa. Or they could be informal but common practices, such as limited access to education or healthcare for marginalized groups. Cultural violence represents the existence of prevailing or prominent social norms that make direct and structural violence seem natural or right, or at least acceptable. For example, the belief that Africans are primitive and intellectually inferior to Caucasians gave sanction to the African slave trade. Galtung's understanding of cultural violence helps explain how prominent beliefs can become so embedded in a given culture that they function as absolute and inevitable and are reproduced uncritically across generations. These three forms of violence are interrelated and mutually reinforcing. And understanding them better is crucial for the pursuit of a broader and deeper peace. All right, so quickly, what are some what are some thoughts? Violence triangle, direct, structural, and cultural. What did you hear? Do, 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 do. Yes. 
the low rim. Thank you for that contribution. You said a, a couple of key words in your response. Mm -hmm. And so as we return then to the recognized definition of violence and you reflect on the definition that we reviewed, would you make any tweaks or not? Is this still generally acceptable? And that's what well, that's for everybody. You can comment, but Anything key that anyone sees? Yes, professor. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so y'all, uh, we, we, we had it with Jada. Now we got it with the word intentional. <laughs> So yeah, absolutely correct. And, and that's one of the words you said, my brother, uh, as you provided your reflection, the intentional use of physical force of power. And that's problematic because that discounts structural and cultural violence, right? And so if we are as a society honed in on all of that, the direct, the interpersonal forms of violence, then that means typically the elements that facilitate or sometimes referred to as the root cause of the violence, they go un untapped. Right. We're not attending to those things. We're not intervening. We're not disrupting. We're not dismantling things that are actually uh, the knobs to the faucet that allows the violence to, to continue to run like water. And so with that quick overview of how violent the many ways in which violence is conceptualized, uh, this is something that came out in 2015 from California, a group of people. Uh, conception, if you will, this is the consciousness of public health, right? So speaking of uncritically reproducing landscapes, as you just heard in the video, uh, what have we done and what must we do as public health professionals? So as we see to the right, it's delineated as current public health practice, and not just current, but historical, right? Public, we know that public health was born out of more or less a biomedical model, right? So the things that we see on the right, uh, death, disease, injury, disability, what are the things that are causing those and how do we address those, right? And so that's what you see in the risk behaviors. And everything downstream focuses on a disease and an individual. And, uh, and, and, and again, the people who conceptualized how public health functions, again, that was done primarily through a biomedical model. And so when we think about theories, when we think about intervention, and when we think about funding, those are the elements wherein a lot of the intervention lie. And so what you see to the left is the emerging public health practice, right? What we must do. And so those are a lot of environmental factors, right? When we look at the living conditions, so the physical environment, social service environment, economic and work environments, and then the institutions that we all have to navigate. A lot of these institutions are associated with our human rights. And so we all have to navigate them. To what extent as we navigate them, are these institutions resources for us or sources of violence for us, right? Those are critical questions that we have to ask as public health professionals, but also as mere humans. And then we have the social inequities and those are you know, determined by the identities that have been opposed, imposed upon us through social construction. And so as we shift then and talk about violence, I wanna hop to a critical event that created a pivotal moment for us within the landscape of violence prevention in our country. So in 1999, we had the Columbine High School shooting, 15 people, including the two student shooters were dead when we had 21 people who were wounded. And that was a critical intersection 
we had public outcry, we had a political will, and we had a window of opportunity, right? And so because of that intersection, Congress appropriated funds for violence prevention amongst young people, right? And so the CDC facilitated that initiative, that engagement around violence prevention among young people, or as they call it, youth violence prevention. Uh, so they des designated, they created and designated centers of excellence that were deemed youth violence prevention centers. And so since the year 2000, over $100 million has been spent uh, on academic and community partnerships within communities to address violence prevention among young people. And so the issue is, well, we get to the issue on the next slide. I want you to take note first of what is seen on this slide, right? So if you attend to the racial demography in this image that you see, it illustrates predominantly white harm. White harm, white victimization, and white grief. And so we know that in this country, that engages empathy, right? That engages empathy and that engages urgent actions that attempt to resolve the issues associated with the grief, the harm, the victimization, right? And so again, when we talk about that political will and that public outcry, that intersection and Congress enacting and allocating funds, millions of dollars to address this issue, what we saw was organizing. We saw the ruling class flexing their power to address the imagery that we see in this picture. Right, and we saw them do that in order to make shit happen to disrupt that white harm, that white grief, that white victimization. And so I wanna juxtapose that with as black youth and communities have experienced harm in this country, harm, victimization, grief, and death, right? The country has not engaged in empathy and urgent structural actions to resolve our issues. What happens is that victimization, that harm, that grief is pathologized, right? And so to illustrate that, right? Throw an academician out there. Do Dr. John DeLulio, who's currently at University of Pennsylvania, he, uh, he engaged in a quantitative study, right? And he said, based, and this was in the 90s, based on crime rates in certain neighborhoods, Right, we're gonna see mass murders of these predominantly black males in our societies. They're gonna be bloodshed. You know what I'm saying? He did a great job at illustrating and creating a dominant narrative about black men and boys in communities. And so uh, he facilitated this study, this quantitative projection model and said, if action does not occur right now, these are the numbers that we're gonna see as it relates to, uh, to violence in, these, in our streets, in our communities. And so again, created that dominant narrative with the power of his whiteness, with the power of his gender, with the power of his degree, right? University of Pennsylvania, doctor. And so what happened? They coined the term super predators, right? In the nineties. So I grew up in the nineties. So a number, of, a number of us, as we navigated our urban and inner city communities, that's what we were looked at. Right. So when we talk about structural and cultural narratives being built and projected onto people, as we saw in this video, this was yet another instance of how culture and structure facilitate violence onto specific communities uh, at a population level. So not only did he coin the term super predators, but what happened? Well, the U.S. governor bought into it as well. So we had President Clinton number of congresspersons saying, you know, yeah, we got to we got to intervene. We got to stop the super predators. And so what happened? We didn't get funding to address right issue issue issues related to structural oppression. What we got funding for was criminal justice. So we saw budgets for prisons go up. We saw budgets for police departments increase. And additionally, his model failed. Right. The prediction for for what he said would happen notwithstanding the funding from these particular departments, it just never materialized, right? And so what you had was predatory policing. Uh, you had school to prison pipelines being built based off of a narrative and not actually based off of, you know, what we saw manifesting in our lived environments. And so 
Another quick example that many people might be familiar with from um, from a contemporary standpoint, black and brown communities criminalized for drug addiction, right? Back in the 80s, 90s, up through today, versus now when we see the opioid addiction, white communities, what happens? Decriminalizing these particular drugs, empathy is shown, and there are now resources for opioid addiction, right? Instead of instead of right, the alternative, which was jail. And so then, nevertheless, as we observe how the CDC framed youth violence, this is what they emphasized, right? And highlighted in red, youth violence occurs when young people between the ages of 10 and 24 years intentionally use force or power to threaten or harm others. So one, there's that word again, intentionally. Um, but additionally, right, who's this coming from? The CDC. They're the funders for these million dollar partnerships between communities uh, and academicians. And so if this is how they're defining it, how they're framing the issue and how they want academicians and communities to respond to the issue, this is then historically how communities have defined and created interventions to address violence as it occurs within our spaces. And additionally, we, we know that when you look at uh, from a decision-making perspective, when you look at the data, and especially if you are honed in on the quantitative data, what will that tell you? Well, based on how the CDC has defined violence, if we're looking at who's getting suspended and expelled from school districts, if we're looking at who's ending up in the ER with gunshot and stab wounds, if we're looking at who's engaging with the police, right, that paints a certain picture about a racial demography and about certain communities, right? So black urban communities. And so the way this framing played out is that is the way that funding has went within communities, academicians to intervene with it when it comes to violence prevention amongst young people. And so, as I mentioned earlier, over $100 million have been spent. Um, I work in the space, uh, University of Louisville. We were fortunate enough to obtain funding from the CDC to be designated as a Center of Excellence for Violence Prevention. And so some of the issues that I've been discussing up to this point are the same issues that I fought against the CDC and other, you know, strong armed entities to say, yo, like the very framing of this of this issue is violent. Right. So when we talk about how we're discussing violence among young people, right, the replacement language has to be violence that's impacting youth, because when we lead with that as the frame, well, go back to the video, right? Direct violence impacts young people, but also structural and cultural violence. So then when it comes to an intervention, right, and us as researchers and community members uh, identifying what the problems are, the root issues, uh, and what the plans are for us to intervene from a in a responsive manner, now we're covering more of socioecology, right, and not a biomedical or individual and social construct of how we need to intervene. So, uh, Throw this image up here again, right? Told y'all I'm from St. Louis. We know that in the 21st century, this was the uprising of the century. This catapulted the rest of the uprisings that we've seen uh, come thereafter. And so what we also saw was what many of us have for generations heard from our family members and also ourselves experience. So myself, my family, my brother, my cousins are included when we talk about the way that predatory policing uh, you know, has existed in the city of St. Louis, but also just as um, as the inception of police departments exist in the United States, we have to acknowledge the fact that they were created intentionally as U.S. slave patrols, right? So police departments were created to control the movement of, terrorize, and murder Black and Indigenous communities, right? That's literally the history of police departments. And so when we look at a number of the inequities that exist um, from some of the themes that are born out of the DOJ's investigation into the Ferguson Police Department, Louisville Metro Police Department, Breonna Taylor, we can hop around the country and identify the number of Department of Justice reports that have been facilitated and all of the themes that have come out of those reports. And what do they say? They all say the same thing, predatory policing to make money. What is that? Capitalism racial bias, and as a result, community distrust. And so when you look at those themes and compare that to why and when police departments were created, you have to say, mm, is there a difference, right? Or has it just evolved and refined itself? So. 
And so I came back, right? I came, I was, I was actually doing the Ferguson Uprising. I had just been hired by the university uh, in an office for public health practice. I was a month in. And in November, when the sec when the no indictment decision was rendered for the officer who murdered Mike Brown, that was in November. Uh, I went into my office and hollered at my office director and said, yo, see what's going on in St. Louis. She was like, oh my God, yes, it's crazy. You know, we all, you know, many of us remember we saw the National Guard, we saw flames, we saw, you know, flashbangs, we saw it all. And so she was like, is your family okay? And I said, yeah, my, my, my family's cool. Like my mother's house is literally in the midst of the uprising. Uh, and, and she's a war veteran. You know, she says she she literally feels like she's back in the Middle East. Um, but but nevertheless, my family's cool. My point is to you, I'm going to St. Louis tomorrow. My ticket is booked. And so um, let's have a discussion on, you know, what type of implications that this might have on my employment. <laughs> because as you see on TV, people are being indiscriminately arrested. Um, people are being injured, et cetera. And so, you know, let's have this conversation. And And she was sort of like deer in the headlights. And after about 10 seconds, I'm like, yo, this ain't rhetorical. My ticket is booked for the morning. Um, what are the, let, Let's wrap, because I know I'm, I'm a new employee. We don't really know each other that well. You you engage with me based off of seeing me do community work at a community center. Um, you know, and now we got a whole nother issue um, that I'm responsive to. And I want to hear, you know, what are your thoughts? And so she was like, hell yeah, dude. Go to St. Louis, like, I, I got your bail money if you get arrested. <laughs> so, like, all right, cool, we starting off right. But she was like, but what are you going to do? And I'm like, shit, I don't know. Uh, you know, we see that minimally I'm going to engage and stand in solidarity with my community as a disruptor. But additionally, understanding, right, from a cultural and structural predatory perspective as it relates to Black communities, I know that many of the narratives that we see being projected in the news and on social media are not accurate. And so my responsibility and responsiveness as also a researcher tells me that I need to be on the ground capturing something, right? Capturing something about real time narratives uh, that are happening. And so that's what I did. I came here, you know, disrupted, et cetera, but I also began collecting narratives and in imagery pulling from, you know, methods of photo voice uh, and interviewing people about you know, their experiences, et cetera. And so these are some of the images uh, that were captured and cool, I was here for three months. Um, so the cool thing is I'm from here, I was able to, you know, engage, but I didn't live here. So ultimately I had to go back to Louisville, go back to work. Um, but in doing so, upon arrival, right, people from the mayor's office to council persons to community members were like, yo, what did you do in St. Louis? What did you capture? How can we, learn from your experience to ensure that Louisville doesn't become the next Ferguson, right? Put a pin in that. And so um, we began facilitating listening sessions using the imagery and the narrative that was captured from St. Louis community members to provoke conversation, critical reflection and dialogue uh, amongst, you know, Louisville and our, especially in our structurally, most structurally marginalized communities. And so we had three sessions with 51 participants for people who lived, learned, worked, and visited and worshiped in what's called the West End of Louisville. And so these were the themes, right, that emerged from those community listening sessions. Racism and oppression, right? So racism and oppression contribute to lack of opportunity, power, violence, and incarceration. Loss and trauma. So the loss and trauma in the community is so common that people feel frustrated, hopeless, and powerless. System reliance. So we've changed as a society with more reliance on a system and less reliance on individuals, families, and communities, right? So that social capital and that social cohesion. And then do something. So there's recognition that we have to stop talking and do something to stop the violence, right? So despite some of constructs that we visited earlier, such as the cultural and structural violence that has generationally been imposed onto certain communities, there was still this recognition that, you know, despite that, we know that we got to do something. We know that we have to act. And all of our loss and all of our trauma and all, and all of our oppression, we still hold the, hold the responsibility to act on our behalves. And so 
for us, what that meant then, I mentioned this earlier, our YVPRC Prevention Center, uh, we established ours. And so as we began, you know, looking at some of the experiences that I had in St. Louis, but then also some of the data that we collected in St. Louis with some other studies as well, I facilitated, my team and I facilitated a photo voice study uh, and, and the same damn things occurred, right? The racism, the loss, the trauma, the oppression, et cetera. And so when we applied for our grant with the CDC, um, we conceptualized our philosophical and practical approach around structural and cultural violence, not the interpersonal violence that the CDC had for 15 years funded, right? And so it was a crapshoot. We ended up getting funded. And, you know, our components uh, of our content, of our proposal, for example, right, first words of our grant were Mike Brown, Trayvon Martin, Sandra Bland, it was a couple of more names. So that's literally how we opened up with our grant narrative. And so as it relates to the components of our grant, some of the key uh, elements that we wanted to ensure was that um, racial, racial and ethnic identity development were included, youth development were, was included, and socio-political development was included. Because as an aspect of our work, we hired young people from these structurally marginalized communities to say, yo, we can't do violence prevention work on youth without them. And we damn sure can't expect structurally marginalized young people from these communities to do it for free. So we hired them to engage them in understanding critical consciousness, consciousness as it relates to their experiences as young people uh, in these societies. And so what that mean, means for us then is that we were able to engage them in critically conscious ways as employees we engage them in public health analyses, right? So how does each system that you see on the screen, and, and these obviously are not comprehensive, but uh, how do these systems intersect with facets of ecology, right? So when we consider policy and communities and organizations, et cetera, is this a resource for you and your com community or is this a source of violence for you and your community? And so we also were in, able to engage them. So it wasn't just a thought project. It was also about that critical action, right? So how do we engage them in translating their experiences, their wisdoms into critical social action? And so these are some of the activities that uh, myself and some of my colleagues were able to facilitate with our young people, right? So creation of black student unions at high schools, uh, engaging with the mayor to get money moved around six and seven figures to prioritize equity work for the city. Um, they were applying for and winning grants, right? So we talking about my good people, my good homies from the hood who didn't have, you know, some of them didn't have people to engage them in construction, constructive and positive esteem for themselves or their communities. They're now writing grants and winning grants to then go into their communities and their high schools to teach other students about structural violence. Um, protesting, right, against certain mediating structures and entities that exist in our communities that are so sources and perpetuants of violence. Um, you know, the, yeah, I, can, I think that's pretty accurate when I say all of them were engaged in, you know, resistance against the oppression that facilitated Breonna Taylor's murder and then also the anti-CRT um, or, you know, quote unquote, as, as they deemed it, critical race theory. So just an example, right, liquor license protests. So again, you know, many urban cities across the country say, yo, violence is an issue, um, we need to address it. When we look at from a public health perspective, from a legislative perspective, some of the powers that we hold, uh, some of those powers are zoning powers, right? So, but in Louisville, alcohol sales aren't zoned. So what we see now is entities such as Family Dollar um, and also other independent entrepreneurs who want to open up stores that keep popping up the stores in our structurally marginalized high crime communities. And so if we know, though, if we look at CDC's risk factors for violence and those risk factors, one of those risk factors is alcohol and substance abuse. So if we're connecting the dots, then why do we keep allowing the erection of these stores and the, uh, the licenses of, for these particular businesses to sell more alcohol, to put more toxins into our communities, right? And so this was an issue, young people engaged in protests, so they worked with council persons uh, to door knock, get, acquire petitions, 
protested. They also went around to youth serving organizations to engage them in a criti critical conversation, but also in a critical action of resisting this. And, you know, what we saw was the alcohol board control uh, denied the liquor license application and the two top cited reasons were one because of community opposition and two because of the oversaturation of alcohol outlets that exist within our black and brown neighborhoods in Louisville, right? And so the young people were like, damn, we protested and we did X, Y, and Z and it actually worked, right? So for them, it was a big win because, you know, they hear about attempting to, you know, facilitate community change and they associate that with history, right? And it's like, no, you can make history every day, right? If we engage, if we understand and actualize the power that we have as individuals, but also as collective communities. So that was big for them and their socio-political development, their consciousness, um, and it translated into other things that they wanted to do as well. Fast forward to, what time is it, by the way? Yeah, okay. So fast forward, so let's fast, right? I get, gave a frame of how violence has been conceptualized, some of the ways that within our U.S. landscape, violence prevention and interventions have been funded, some of the work that I've been able to facilitate myself and my colleagues and my community members and youth leaders in Louisville. And that, was, that work started for us in 2015, and those were five-year grants. And so let's fast forward to 2020 then, right? So we had a confluence of factors that you know, impacted us all. We were all, whether directly or indirectly, impacted by what we see on the screen. COVID, we had the murder of Ahmaud Arbery, we had the murder of George Floyd, and we had the murder of Rihanna Taylor. And then what we saw from a public health perspective, we saw a number of public health declarations. And those declarations said, yo, racism is a public health crisis. And these declarations were facilitated by a number of uh, state legislatures, local city councils, uh, professional organizations. Uh, and again, this began occurring in 2020. In 2019, mind you, I wanna mention that the first declaration of this, of this kind uh, was facilitated by Milwaukee's city council, right? And so, and that happened in May of 2019. From May 2019 to May 2020, we had approximately five to 10 racism as public health crisis declarations. Uh, from May 2020, right? So if we go back to when those uprisings jumped off for Brianna, Ahmad, et cetera, and then also the narrative about COVID and the inequities that existed and who was catching it, who was dying from it, who had access to resources from it, who was able to stay at home and engage their, their kids in homeschooling, doing it right. A number of these inequities were lifted up. And what we, oh, hold on, let me see. This was ours in Louisville, by the way, yours truly presented to our Louisville Metro Council to say, yo, we need to hop on this. But anyway, May 2020, forward, if you look on a APHA's website now, there are literally hundreds of declarations of public health, uh, racism as a public health crisis. And so what did that mean then, right? We got the discipline responding, but then we also have academia in general responding. So we had universities responding at large, but, but, but something that was critical that we never really seen before to this extent, we saw the capitalists respond, right? So we had City and Chase saying, yo, 100 million, 30 billion, right? We're, we're, we're acknowledging the racial history, the structural and the cultural violence. And so we're making billion dollar investments into what this means for racially minoritized communities, especially those that are black and this generational suffering. And so when you've got capitalistic Right, the engine of America responding to this, right? Because that's damn near akin with reparations, right? And so people said, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. We're going too far. And so what we saw at the end of 2020, well, September 2020, we saw former President 45, he created an executive order on combating race and sex stereotyping, right? And so divisive concepts. And you see what some of those are, right? Uh, race, sex is inherently superior, superior to another 
race or sex. Upon first glass and hearing that, some people might think, oh, he's been talking about white supremacy, right? No number of other terms that they alluded to within this executive order, but what it did is it said no federal agencies or agencies that receive financial uh, financial resources from federal agencies can engage in this type of work. And so what that meant at that time, because again, we were CDC funded, our program officers uh, hit us up like, yo, we can't communicate with y'all right now because I just mentioned to y'all the type of work that we were doing. And they also told us, you know, hey, you know, we have to buy about executive order. You all do too. And so what that meant, oh, this is being recorded. So let me chill. Oh, um, <laughs> y'all might get the point. But, um, you know, the work, the work, we, we had to do what we had to do um, to counter and to defy white supremacy. And so, oh, I thought we were actually on the slide. So, yeah, snapshot of some of the content from the executive order. And so then what we saw, that was in 2020. What we saw in 2021, this group called Moms Demand Action, they erected, they began auditing, raiding, school libraries in the K through 12 level. Uh, and we also saw them running for school boards, right? Attempting to gain that control over the content that is being you know, held within public libraries and being taught within our school systems. And so we also saw in 2021 and 2022, uh, I think I actually might need to go back, yeah. Uh, we saw anti-critical race theory legislation. And so if you see what I have circled here, that legislation emphasized race, sex, and religion, right? So again, aligning themselves with the federal executive order that was facilitated because we need to get a, we need to get a handle on the consciousness of people. We can't have people engaging in critical consciousness activities because then that translates to action, that translates to thwarting the ruling class, right? So we're being threatened. In what ways can we get a handle on the way that people are acquiring this critical uh, critical consciousness and social action content. And so you began to see this, you know, with institutes like the Manhattan Institute, the Goldberg Institute, Claremont Institute, Heritage Institute, et cetera. Um, so, you know, their work, their organizing continues. These groups, they are well-funded, right? You see the donate button. <laughs> they let you know they're getting that money, but they're also well-organized. They're intentional and they are targeted and they definitely have a marketing and a narrative campaign. Anti-critical race theory, that had nothing to do with critical race theory. That had something to do with ensuring gender supremacy, gender supremacy, religion supremacy, and racial supremacy in the term of whiteness, so white supremacy. And we saw the same thing with DEI legislation, right? So we know Florida, Texas, Tennessee with some of the trailblazers from a state perspective and outlawing this content within academic institutions. And now I'm in that same fight in Kentucky. When we talk about those, uh, those social constructions of race, sex, and religion, we go to the latest data that we have from the FBI and hate crime statistics. Uh, we have the highest bias motivated hate crimes in the context of racial and ethnic, uh, racial and ethnic ancestry. Right. And so 48 and a half percent of that bias from a racial perspective is anti-black or African-American in nature. Right. And second is anti-whiteness at 15.7 percent. Religion, second highest hate crimes. Sexual orientation, third highest hate crimes. So, again, if we're looking at what they are attempting to outlaw, our consciousness and how we resolve, how we mediate, how we intervene with the oppression that is imposed upon cer certain socially constructed identities, when we triangulate that with the data as it relates to who is targeted most for hate crimes, it is these same identities that they're banning us from learning about, from engaging with, right? So dangerous. And so what that means for us in Kentucky then is public health professionals, we got to understand and we have to create our narratives, our dominant narratives about what this really is, right? And so again, this is cultural and structural violence. They are criminal. These are some of the sponsors of just uh, some, uh, one of our bills. We have three currently moving through our legislature. These are uh, the sponsors. And so for me, it was key to inform the public 
on the demographic profile of who we have sponsoring this legislation and also aligning that for comparison and contrasting purposes with what they were actually attempting to outlaw. And so when we look at that analysis, they were 100% Republican, 90% Christian, 100% white, 70% male, right? And so what does that mean? Once again, political ideology, domination or supremacy, Christian supremacy, white supremacy, and male supremacy. So we have to continue to enforce these are the real narratives. This is the real violence that is happening uh, within our state legislatures. Additionally, my role as a dean at the University of Louisville, an assistant dean for culture and liberation, uh, as I assumed that position, I did some, you know, assessing the landscape and ultimately determined that uh, I needed to facilitate policy, right? So policy that mandated critical consciousness education training and experiential activities for every employee and every student at the School of Public Health. So that includes faculty, staff, and administrators, in addition to the students. Uh, and so my team, and so this is a snapshot of some of the, some of the people uh, on my team, some of the ambassadors on signing day. This was June 30th, 2023, actually the first of its kind being signed uh, into its formality at our university. And so the plan was then what we should be doing right now is focusing on the implementation of this very policy, right? So the National Association for Diversity Officers in Higher Education, they came out with this in 2021, their prescription for areas that we should be attending to within academic institutions as it relates to quote unquote equity work. And so I started with, as you see, number eight, the education and the training component. Where we should be right now is looking at the curriculum and pedagogy. So how are we ensuring that systematically all of our students, whether they're biostat students or otherwise, how are they engaging in this critical consciousness education, training and activities, right? And so what we're doing now though, all of that is on pause because we're engaging in attending to the legislative threat of banning all quote unquote DEI activities. And so again, it's not under the the context of what diversity, equity, inclusion actually mean, it goes back to those, goes back to those constructs, right? People learning about white supremacy, which we know is colonism, capitalism, colonialism, war, imperialism, et cetera. Um, and they know that as well, but right, if we learn about those things from an agenda perspective, then we begin to resist, right? And so that's what, for example, Movement for Black Lives said. They said, yo, we gotta prioritize, invest in diverse strategies economic justice, what does that look like? Us engaging in participatory engagement and control of, of financing of our communities, political power, et cetera. How many people, by the way, have been formally educated on these particular topics? What's that? On what you see on the screen, right? So not formally, not systematic, and that's intentional. Um, and again, policy has a lot to do with this because when we think about what's law versus what, what's moral, it was legal, right, to redline. It's legal currently in our prison industrial complex, like slavery and voluntary servitude is still allowed in the prison systems. And it was legal, as I mentioned earlier, for police to kill, murder, control movement of people. So this was just yesterday. I got two hours of sleep the night before I got here because men have missed this fight, but uh, you know, showed up, stood in solidarity with our students, right? So standing with them, for them, et cetera, as we all will be directly impacted by this fight. We're literally talking about our jobs will be dissolved if this, legislat if this legislation passed. University of Florida just fired all of their people two weeks ago, right? To be in compliance with the law that Florida passed. And so uh, as I wrap up, wanna hop to our good friend, Paulo Freire from the pedagogy of the oppressed. He said, herein lies one of the reasons for the prohibitions and the difficulties designed to dissuade the people from critical intervention in reality. The oppressor knows full well that this intervention would not be to his interest. What is to his interest is for the people to continue in a state of submersion, impotent in the face of oppressive reality. And so this is why we have laws popping up to prevent us from this higher acknowledgement, higher vibration, higher consciousness is because it is threatening the ruling class. 
and uh, I will chill right there. Just know if you have a question, we'll use this microphone so the people online can hear. So anybody in the room have a question? Sydney question or comment. Or comment, yes. Insights. You read it for us? Do you believe that divesting from the police and putting funding back into communities could improve violence outcomes? And what could that look like short-term and long-term? And how could accountability and safety still be preserved? Definitely can't answer all that. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say I do believe in, in best divest, generally speaking, right? So in communities across the country, especially those communities that have seen the face of a DOJ report, right? Communities have then said, Yo, we need the monies that are being allocated to police departments, police budgets. It definitely should be invested into communities because, for example, police are responding and they have been forthcoming about they're responding to issues that they're not equipped to handle. So when we talk about them responding to mental health calls for where, wherein people are facing mental health crises, for example, that could easily turn into a murder because you're not trained to assess mental health issues, what might that look like if we equip or create infrastructure for alternative response models, right? When someone needs to be called, but that someone is not the police, for example. So within the city of Louisville, we actually have in our piloting right now, uh, that particular model. And so some cities have uh, implemented and used that model across the country. Um, it's definitely not uh, you know, a widespread implementation initiative across the country. Uh, but again, some cherry pick cities are saying, yo, what does it look like uh, for us to identify certain resources and rights that I mentioned or that we all saw on that wheel, right? If we took from that budget and incorporate, because in our cities, in many cities, police have the biggest budgets, right? They have the biggest budgets. But when we and when we think about then from a cultural and structural perspective, the root causes of inequities in our systems, and a lot of that comes from disenfranchisement from those human resources and rights, those same systems are underfunded or not funded at all. So again, generally speaking, when we talk about invest, divest strategies, yes, what do we need more of and what do we need less of? We need more of rights and resources connected to system, and we need less of the predatory policing that continues to be facilitated and founded and validated by Department of Justice. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much for picking out words that are really powerful in terms of rhetorical pushback. Mm -hmm. I'll pick out um, white harm, white victimization, white grief. This, you can just flip those back and use them in the context of black people. So mm -hmm. thank you very much for that. But my question, yes, <laughs> uh, my question is on the three. So you, you talked about direct violence, uh, structural violence and um, cultural violence and under um, direct violence. I'd like to pick out um, how in research the relationship between male psych, male uh, infant male psychopathology, uh, the association between that and adult male perpetration of violence is kind of ignored and the entry of men into the justice system. So I'd like to ask, um, how would you further try to, doesn't that further compound the aspect of direct violence? And then at system, at um, structural level, there are policies that, and intervention design that kind of ignores that aspect mm -hmm. to operationalize. And the focus is always on designing interventions to address 
violence as it affects women, but kind of ignores the fact that may there is that issue from infant level that you know affect men at a later stage, which opens them into the justice system because of homicide and all of that stuff. So how would you kind of frame that? So you said a lot. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm. I attempted to follow um, what I would just lift up because I don't know if I'm going to answer your question. Uh, that's definitely more of a conversation. Um, what I heard, you know, you said infant, you named a particular nomenclature from I'm assuming somewhere in psychology or psychiatry or something. But, but yeah, so essentially what generally that goes back to is the cycle, right, in developmental stages, right? So I don't, you might be familiar with the cycle of socialization and the cycle of liberation, right? And so what those do is those illustrate how we're socialized as humans when we come into the world, right? But we also know that our socialization, it doesn't necessarily begin, right, when we pop out. <laughs> it, we're holding on to generational changes in our DNA, right, epigenetics. And so when we start intersecting the, the epigenome of our experience under violence and oppression and what that looks like when we are engaged socially, not just in the United States, but in the world that is facilitated under those specific constructs that I mentioned earlier, right? So imperialism, war, colonialism, capitalism that that's not an that's not particular to one gender one race we're all submerged in that right and so i think when we realize that as humans but also as academicians um, as community members interested in preventing violence across as you mentioned direct structural and cultural levels that's the level of general understanding that we have to get to right in some respects, some people face, they face less harm as it relates to the structural and cultural perspectives of violence. Some face more, but when we are able to identify that everybody is impacted, whether you think you, you, you're buffered from it or not, right? You're not. Um, and so the, the quicker that we realize that this really is a human issue, a human issue of socialization and systems, then that's when our interventions will look differently, right? But until we get to that, and, and, and what does that go back to? That goes back to legislation saying, when we do get to the critical understandings that you're talking about, how we're socialized from a gender perspective, racial perspective, class perspective, when we identify and make the connections to violence, to oppression, et cetera, we begin to what? We act differently, we intervene differently. And so because that is the phenomenon that is happening, we now see the legislation that says that can't happen. So, yep. Hey, thank you so much. I know we are a little bit past one, so I wanna thank everybody for being here. A special thanks to Dr. Jackson. Please help me thank him one more time for being here. Thank y'all. And if you um, are a student and have signed up for the student lunch with Dr. Jackson, that is over in Hillman 100. So um, he will see you over there. Otherwise, thank you, everybody, and have a great rest of the day. Should I leave this yeah. or just email? Uh,